Welcome to APC F4 study. In this introductory lecture, we're going to be having a look at the format of the exam, how the exam interacts with other modules of the ACCA course, and also explore some revision techniques. So the aim of the F4 exam is not to try and bring you up to the standard of a law student. As you are accountancy students, the aim of the F4 exam is to flag important legal issues to you that you might come across during your professional life. This will give you the opportunity to know when an issue may arise and therefore seek appropriate legal advice as and when necessary. Um, as it says on your notes, the ACCA says that this syllabus is designed to progressively broaden and deepen the knowledge, skills and professional values demonstrated by the student on their way through the qualification. So that gives you a little bit of background as to what the exam is trying to achieve. In terms of where the F4 exam fits into the rest of the ACCA qualification, F4 is one of the fundamental skills examinations. Um, it's a two-hour written exam, which you can do um, um, in an exam centre written, or you can do as a computer-based exam. As it's a fundamental skills level exam, it consists of uh, compulsory questions. You're expected to answer every one 100%. So looking at the format of the exam in a little bit more detail, the exam itself is split into two sections, section A and section B. Section A of the exam has 25 objective test questions. Um, these are either worth two marks each, which is about 50% of the exam, or they're worth uh, one mark each, which is about 20% of the exam. Um, they will ask you to choose the correct answer from a series of multiple choice answers, and the two mark questions will require you to, cho you to choose one correct answer from four, and the one mark question will ask you to choose the correct answer from three possible answers. In your notes, there are a couple of examples of these, as you can see. And section B of the exam is slightly different. Section B is five multitask questions. These are each worth six marks, and in total, section B is worth 20% of your exam. These will usually set you um, a scenario and require you to apply the knowledge that you have um, gained and learnt throughout the course to these scenarios. If you're doing a computer-based exam, the answers will still be multiple choice. If you are doing a paper-based exam, you will be required to um, write your answer and explain your reasoning. And as before, in the notes, I've given you an example of what a computer-based Part B question will look like. Um, the background, the scenario is the same, but as you can see, each task has two marks available and they are multiple choice, whereas the same Part B question from a paper-based exam with the same scenario requires you to actually state your answer and your reasoning, but it's three part parts to it and each is again worth two marks. This is a very, very passable exam. It's 50% pass mark, and if you opt for the multiple choice option, um, it's a very easy um, amount of exam points to achieve. So in terms of the syllabus, let's move on to that now. As you can see in your notes, our outline syllabus has eight subject areas. We'll be covering these over the course of the next few lectures. So we're going to start off with looking at essential elements of the legal system. And this is really the building block for the rest of your course. It's going to explain to you how the English legal system works, where we get our law from, and our different court systems. And so this first chapter is a very good grounding for the rest of the course. We're then going to move on to the law of obligations. This is primarily contract law and tort law which we will look at in quite a lot of detail. These are both very examinable areas, so we'll spend quite a lot of time looking at this. The next area is employment law. This is an area that students traditionally find fairly easy. It's something that a lot of people have come across in their lives before, and it's fairly straightforward and um, a quite short chapter. So we'll be looking at employment law next. 
then we'll look at the formation and constitution of business organisations. So during this section of the course we will look at the different ways that you can um, set up in business. We'll look at partnership law, agency law, we will look at company law and the different types of companies that are available under English law and how you go about setting them up. We'll then look at, uh, in section five, at capital and the financing of companies. So this is basically split into two areas, primarily, and that is share capital and loan capital. They are the two main ways that you can finance your company and we will look at each of them in turn, look at the differences between them and the advantages and disadvantages of each. In section six, we're going to look at the management, administration and the regulation of companies. So this is how companies can be set up, how they're run. So we're going to look at the board of directors, um, what there are in terms of rights for shareholders as owners of the company and that kind of thing in this section. In section seven, we're going to look at insolvency law. So insolvency is when things start to go wrong, when your business doesn't have enough money. And we're going to look at some of the uh, different insolvency procedures that are available under English law. And finally, section eight, we're going to look at corporate fraudulent and criminal behavior. So this is things to do with the management of the company in terms of directors. It's also um, issues that can arrive arise when you come to the end of the life of a company, when it is insolvent. Um, and we're going to look at other attributes of criminal behaviour in respect of companies, such as bribery, money laundering, that kind of thing. So that is the outline syllabus in your eight core areas. The next slide is a, an extract from the ACCA syllabus and study guide. This is a very useful slide to show you how the F4 exam fits in with other exams in your course. So it has a relationship with um, P2 corporate reporting, F7 financial reporting and F8 audit and assurance. So there will be transferable skills between all of these four exams and knowledge that you will have built on having undertaken the exams that you will find useful as you go forward through your course. And as it says on the slide, the aim is to develop knowledge and skills in the understanding of the general legal framework. We're not expecting you to know in-depth knowledge of particular legal areas. We're trying to give you an overview, but particularly of specific legal areas relating to business and therefore giving you the ability to recognise the need to seek further specialist legal advice where necessary as you go through your qualification. So the main capabilities there on the right hand side we have just discussed, those are the eight core areas that we're going to look at as we go through the course. And further down the slide you will see a relational diagram of the main capabilities. So as I said, section A, the essential elements of the legal system where we're going to start, really flows into most of the areas um, as we go on through the course. And then we build on that knowledge, we build on that knowledge in terms of the law of obligations, employment law, and forming and constituting business organisations, which then helps us understand further how such companies are financed, how they're run, what happens when they go wrong, and as I said, corporate fraudulent and criminal behaviour. So hopefully that diagram will give you a little bit of information as to how the whole course sits together. The ACCA splits its knowledge in terms of the whole course into three intellectual capabilities that each of the exams assess. Level one is knowledge and comprehension. Level two is application and analysis. And finally, level three is synthesis and evaluation. I have set out in the notes for you a detailed summary of the course and you'll see as we go through that each of these areas will be adequately covered for you to um, go forward to your exam. And I've also given them the level from the three intellectual capabilities that ACCA gives them. I don't propose to read these all out uh, right now in this lecture, but you'll see I've split each of the core areas into its detailed requirements and that for F4, it basically falls into all ones and twos just scroll through all of that. 
So I hope that gives you a little bit of an understanding as to what is going to be um, required of you as we go forward. And um, this will give you a little bit of information as to everything that we're going to cover during the course and um, hopefully give you some confidence that everything that ACCA requires you to know will be covered in these notes. So moving on to revision techniques. If any of you have already undertaken any of the ACCA papers, the F4 syllabus will um, strike you as quite different. Some students find F4 a little bit daunting, particularly for those who are, pro are approaching this with a numbers brain, with a requirement to uh, use your accountancy skills that you have, you have learned today. This is a very different syllabus because it's very wordy. We're going to be covering a lot of information quite a lot of technical knowledge that you will need to learn and retain. So this kind of paper in terms of your revision requires quite a different approach when you, when you think about how you're going to revise and study for it. So you have lots of tools available to you though. You have this study note, you have the recorded lectures with me, and we're going to do, as we go through the course, lots of practice questions. Practice questions are a really, really good way of consolidating your knowledge. We are primarily going to use questions from past papers, so you will see the standard that is required from you from um, actual past ACCA F4 exams. We're at the revision stage also going to look at another bank of questions, so there'll be lots of opportunity for you to revisit these during your revision phase, and you'll see that the same kind of things are regularly tested and crop up, and hopefully that will give you some reassurance of the areas that you need to study. So as we go through the lectures, um, I will be talking to you and adding to the study notes. So it's a good idea to take additional notes and put things into your own words. Highlight any key points. I'll be highlighting things as we go through. So please feel free to um, highlight the same areas to make them stand out in your notes. And some students find that if you uh, then post listening to the lecture, sit down and summarise the notes yourself in a diagram form, that can also help. Lists, I have been um, telling my students for a while, if you are not very good at remembering lists, then you could use what's known as a mnemonic, where you attribute um, the first letter of each of the list to a little phrase that you'll understand well. We can ha I'll give you some examples of mnemonics as we go through the course, if that's the kind of learner that you are, if you find that helpful. So in terms of studying and revision, there are very, very many approaches to revision. It very much depends upon what type of learner you are, particularly for these wordy papers. Some people find just reading and rereading the notes is enough and doing the practice questions. Um, an approach that I found useful in the past that I recommend to my students is to sit down and read a chapter at a time. Don't try and read the whole study note when you revise. Set yourself a revision timetable, break it down into chapters and re review the chapter, review the notes you've taken during the recorded lecture and then summarise it in your own words. Summarising in your own words is really useful because it very quickly identifies areas that you perhaps don't understand and you could go back and revisit. Once you've summarised it and you're happy that you understand it all, then it's a very good idea to then summarise it further, perhaps into short bullet points. Those bullet points you can then use as almost like flashcards and use them to memorise those bullet points and look at them over and over again until you've got those points clear in your mind. And once you've done that, you can then start adding the detail back in. As I said in the study note, putting the flesh back on the bones, as it were, of your initial bullet points, skeleton, um, information and you can build on that, you can add case names, you can add any legislation that is Acts of Parliament we'll talk about as we go through the course and then you can revise that and that's a really really good way to build on your knowledge. I highly recommend before you undertake the exam to at least do one mock exam under time conditions so you can go onto the ACCA website and you can download a mock exam and you can trial that in two hours under exam conditions. It's a really good way to feel what that two hour time period feels like and how much time you've got to apply to all the questions that are asked of you. <clears throat> so when it comes to the exam, Key points to remember, 
I really, really stress this. Read each question thoroughly. It's very, very easy to uh, read a positive as a negative, that kind of thing. Make sure you understand exactly what's required of you and then read it again just to make sure. So yeah, as I said, are you being asked to identify the correct answer or the incorrect answer? There's so many examples I can give of students who have done the, the opposite of that because they are under pressure, under exam conditions. And that's really easy marks loss, particularly if you knew the answer to the question. Don't misread it. Make sure you know what's being asked of you. This, as I said, is a question where you are required to answer all of them. It's 100% compulsory. So whatever you do, don't miss any questions out. Have a go. There is no harm in putting something down, particularly if you're doing the multiple choice option. Eliminate the answers that you know are wrong, which might take you down to two or three maybe, and then you might only have two to guess from and you've got a 50% chance of getting that answer right. But if you guess it, you're not going, if you don't guess it, you're not going to get it right. Be conscious of your time, particularly because part B at the end is the longer questions. Don't spend too long on a question that you're not sure about. Move on. Go back to it when you've got some more time. Go through the paper and get your easy marks, the questions that you know and are confident with, and come back and do the trickier ones later on. That is pretty much all I want to tell you in terms of the syllabus and some tips for revision in the exam. But I just wanted to tell you one thing about case law and acts of parliament. These are very specific to the F4 course. They are legal concepts. And um, it does tend to um, daunt students a little bit when they see the amount of cases, particularly in the law of obligations section that we're going to have a look at. We are not expecting you to memorize all of the cases and all of the facts because you are not, as I said, training to be law students. But these cases are very good illustrations of legal points. If you are doing the paper-based exam, you would be expected to use these cases to demonstrate your knowledge and illustrate your points. It's unlikely in the multiple choice exam that you are going to be given the cases by name. There's a few exceptions to that which might possibly be quoted by name, which I will flag as we go through the exam. But on the whole, in the multiple choice exam, you just need to understand the point of law that the cases are trying to illustrate. There will often be scenario questions that use the facts of cases though, so you'll see them hopefully and they will ring a bell in your mind and you'll, un you'll remember from your revision what the outcome of that case is. So even if you don't remember the legal point particularly, having a knowledge of the cases can really help you with the scenario questions as to what the right answer might be. We're going to talk about legislation as we go through the course. These are Acts of Parliament. Um, you don't have to remember specific section numbers of the legislation. Again, if you're doing the paper-based exam, you may be required to know the name of an Act of Parliament. Um, but if you're doing the multiple choice, um, it may or may not be quoted and you need to have a very broad understanding of what that act is about but specific section numbers is completely unnecessary so please don't waste time in your revision learning these.